Haven't we been seeing some strange weather recently? Well, my dear friends, I hope you've all been keeping safe, warm, and out of danger. And of course, I also hope this isn't going to put you off tonight's story. Which details the events of a particularly nasty storm and its consequences. Now, you know it's not going to be too bad, so I hope you're going to stick around and uh, join me for this one. <laughs> well, my dear friends, it's Wednesday, but I think you can all just sit back and relax with your favorite drink. Because I've got a story to tell you. And it goes something like this. I didn't always live in the lap of luxury like I do now, in a dingy studio apartment on the second floor of a dilapidated apartment building where, in the summer, the air conditioners do little more than to blow hot air. It's actually a summer night as I write this, with a shitty box fan rattling away, but cooling me down in the absence of adequate AC. I can hear my neighbours going at it through the paper-thin walls, <laughs> and I'm honestly not sure if they're fucking or getting murdered. Maybe both. I can't complain too much, though. My apartment has never been broken into, despite living on the edge of the ghetto, and I have never come home to a homeless man masturbating in my bathtub. <laughs> so, that's a plus. However, for all those of you awake tonight... Or today, or whenever you're listening to this, I have a tale to tell you. A tale of evil land, a shitty trailer, and things most foul. Everything in here is 100% true, in that it actually happened. Although, my imagination may have exaggerated the actual events, as I moved away from the land nearly eight years ago. She shit... It's been nearly a decade, and it still feels like yesterday. Sometimes I still feel like a child thrown to the wolves, subjected to terrible things. Sorry, I'm a bit too wordy for my own good sometimes. So, without further ado, let us begin. The events which are about to be disclosed occurred in north-central Arkansas in 1998. The location, names, and ages of certain characters have been changed, or left ambiguous, to remain anonymous. We moved to Arkansas from an eastern state in the spring of 1997. For a year, we lived with my grandfather. Nothing really exciting happened during this time, other than that one time when my brother and I got chased by my grandfather's bull whilst looking for our basketball that had bounced away from us. We were able to slip through some fence and escape the raging beast, <laughs> but that's about all that happened there. So, it was April 1st, 1998. Yeah, we should have known. When we moved to our trailer in the middle of nowhere. When you think of Arkansas, you may think of civilization like Little Rock or Hot Springs. But you probably also think of little backwards towns like Highland or Light. Well, as I just moved from the former about five years ago, I can tell you it hosts no more than 1,200 people. The uh, town our trailer resided in was home to about 100. Yeah, extremely backwards, extremely tiny. To get to the trailer... You had to follow a dirt road off the main highway for about 15 miles. So going to the store was a once a week thing. The road was super creepy at night and, as a child, I would often see figures standing in the woods as our van rushed past, leaving a cloud of dust in its wake. Anyway, I digress. The first few months went great. My brother and I played in the woods. My dog Muzzy was my best friend, and all was well. Then, it happened. While playing in the woods one day, my brother found a skeleton. 
Not a dog or a mountain lion, but a human. I didn't learn of this until years later when he told me, and my dad confirmed it. But I could tell something was off when my brother came back, tears in his eyes, and tugging on my dad's arm to come with him. My dad came back looking disturbed and angry and, in a hushed tone, told my mum what they had found. I asked what they were talking about, and my mum said, Never you mind, go play, quite sternly. Me, being a naive five-year-old that I was, decided that indeed nothing was wrong, and my dad and brother had just found something gross. My mum never spoke of it to me, even years later. Not too long after, we found tridents carved into trees around our property that had not been there before. Now, I myself am a Satanist, and I don't dabble in occult stuff. It's actually two different things altogether. But the appearance of those tridents was a harbinger for all the wicked things to come. First, there was the storm. The storm was unlike any I've ever since experienced. It was late July of 98, and the thunderclouds had ushered the sun to an early rest. My mum had a love of storms. She used to sit on the beach in Florida in her youth and watch hurricanes come in over the ocean. And I had a rather opposite outlook on them. Nonetheless, she dragged me outside to our lawn chairs with a tall pitcher of Kool-Aid and some crackers and cheese. My brother joined us, but my dad worked night shift at a 24-hour pizza place roughly an hour away. Anyway, we sat opposite the sunset facing the roiling clouds of the storm as the final streaks of crimson illuminated them, making them appear to have come out of a volcano rather than out of lakes and rivers. We sat outside as the thunder rattled and rasped and boomed around us. This was way out in the boonies, so every bit of thunder bounced off every bit of tree and seemed to echo into eternity. It was terrifying to my five-year-old self, while my brother, who was three years my elder, cackled alongside my mum at the rolling thunder. Lightning seemed to worship the roiling blackness as it struck down in swiggly and jagged arcs, followed by a loud clash or a crescendo of thunder. Finally, once the rain started and quickly became too heavy, my mum ushered us into the trailer. I was bawling at this point, crying because I had such a fear of storms. My brother jabbed at me like brothers do, but my mum held me and cooed me to where my rattling sobs became only sniffles. We watched Arthur and Dragon Ball Z for an hour or so. All the while, the winds were picking up and shaking the trailer. Then, without any warning of any sort, the power cut out. To my horror, our ears and eyes were subject to the full wrath of the storm. The winds howled like banshees, and the trailer rocked back and forth atop its cinder block foundation. We lived atop a steep hill, which played host to our front yard. So my imagination had already shattered the cinder blocks and sent us tumbling down the hill, leaving us as pulp for my father to find when he returned. <laughs> Clearly, that didn't happen. But something much more terrifying did. The winds had picked up to impossibly high speeds and screeched around corners and moaned through the trees surrounding the trailer. Hail hammered the tin exterior of the home and pinked against the glass, causing my mum to cover us all in thick blankets should the glass give way to the brutality it held at bay. We just sat in the floor of the living room, staring at the large windows that looked out of the overgrown backyard. We stayed in the den because it was the centermost room in the house, and I had insisted that we would cause the aforementioned fear of sending us tumbling to our doom should we move to a bedroom. 
My mom went to the kitchen, retrieved a candle, and lit it. It was a single Christmas candle with Santa's face ablazoned on it, but it lit up the whole living room. The outside world didn't seem to exist. The only things that were real were illuminated by the candle. I saw the reflection of all three of us huddled together in the large bay window. Our gaunt faces seemed to bleed out of the shadows, like light pouring through a crack in the abyss and forming abstractions of people. I shivered in the dark and moved toward the candle, but my mum drew it away a bit as I had already developed an affinity for fire, and she knew it. For another hour, the storm raged on, and for another hour we stayed awake, listened to our mother hum and sing us our favourite nursery rhyme, winkin', binkin', and not. Just as she was nearing the end of the rhyme, everything stopped. The rolling thunder that had been building to a thunderous clap was interrupted. The hail stopped falling along with the rain, and the winds died as if they had never howled through our neck of the woods in the first place. I remember looking at my mum's face, illuminated by the orange flare of the candle, and she looked terrified. Not outright filled with terror, but the kind that gnaws at your soul. The kind where you know something is terribly wrong, but can't do it anything about it. Knock, 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 knock. Three loud, rapid knocks erupted from the back door. My mum's face went pale, her eyes falling wide and jaw slack. She handed my brother the candle. Stay here, Andy. Stay here and don't move. My mum has always been a mama bear, always fought for my brother and I, and always won. But this next moment was the most scared I have ever heard her. I couldn't see her as she had already walked down the hall, which was pitch black past the glow of the candle flame, which flickered in and out as if it threatened to snuff itself out. I heard her shoes thud on the hollow floor of the trailer. Heard the whole thing creak and groan as she moved through it, as if it were living and she was a parasite wiggling her way through. I heard her footsteps stop. She was at the door. Knock, 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 knock. knock. She gasped and I clung harder to my brother, who didn't try and push me away. He must have been as scared as I was. May. A voice erupted from outside, filling the stifling air of the trailer. I heard the scuffle of my mum's shoes as she jumped back. I knew that voice. We all knew that voice. It was my dad. May, let me in. The knocking resumed, and with it came a smell. I didn't know it at the time because I'd never encountered it before, but I later connected it to the smell of dead flesh. Not rotting flesh, but dead flesh. There's quite a difference. Jack, my mum whispered from down the hall. Jack, come here. I whined in horror as she called me the darkness surrounding me settling in my mind as the smell sat in my nose. Jack, I need you to come here, now! She whispered, loudly. Andy held the candle as I let go. Leave the candle with your brother. She said softly, as if she'd read my mind. I tiptoed down the black hall, past the room, what we called our storage room, and its open door, and gaping black moor. I crept past the open bathroom, 
waiting for someone to snatch me. The whole transition from den to door took about ten seconds, but the dread imposed upon me by the dark made it feel like hours. It was all cliches, draining, suffocating, thick. Finally, I spotted white on the door, and realized I'd found my mum's shoes. As I reached her, another series of knocks rang out. May, let me in. It's cold and wet and I've been standing on my feet for the last five hours. She ignored it and crouched down to meet my face. She was pale, and the darkness made her features gaunt. Her eyes looked hollow. Jack, I need you to go to your room, look out of the window, and see if the car is in the driveway. Can you do that for me? I cried and gulped, nodding as she planted a kiss on my sweaty forehead. I stumbled past my mum and into my bedroom and made my way to the window, which was covered by a heavy curtain. I kicked objects scattered across the floor, causing them to clatter and skid on the hard wood. I hoped they were toys, but my mind told me that they were bones, dried and picked clean by a hungry monster that lived under my bed, waiting for me to get close to the mattress so that it could reach out and snatch me. Finally, feeling with my arms, I reached the window. I pulled it open, and what greeted me was what surrounded me. Darkness. No, 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 no. As I kept staring through the wet glass, trying to get my eyes to adjust to the abyss, a flash of lightning caught me off guard and I stumbled back, falling to the floor as a clap of thunder rang out. But it had been just enough for me to see that the driveway was barren that the voice at the door who sounded just like my father was, in fact, not my father. Having seen what I needed to, I scurried out of the room, using the dim glow of the candle at the end of the hall to guide me. I tripped over a pair of shoes, but that didn't stop me as I ran toward my mother. It's not there, I whined in a whisper as tears filled my eyes. Go back with your brother, Jack. He'll keep you safe. I stumbled back down the hall to the den and cuddled up next to my brother. The candle was still lit strong. You're not my husband. Get out of here before I shoot you. She wasn't bluffing. There was a loaded twenty-two by the door, just in case things like this happened. Mommy, Mommy, please let us in. I froze. It was my brother's voice, and this time it came from the wide window in front of us. Whatever it was, it tapped on the glass. Thankfully, it was so dark that I was spared seeing the source of the voice before I stuffed my face in my hands. My brother, however, was not. He screamed. The scream of a dying animal as his voice cried out again. Knock, 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 knock. The knocking on the door was louder, and the tapping on the glass resumed. May, let me in, goddammit. Let me in, let me in, let me in. Mommy, please. It's so cold out here, and it's dark. Mommy. My brother kept screaming his blood-curdling cries causing me to rock back and forth, sobbing into my hands, not daring to look up, for I knew I would see something that I shouldn't. The smell of dead meat intensified, so much to the point where I could taste it through my drooling mouth as sobs racked my chest. Then the whole trailer began to shimmy, not shake like it had in the wind, but shimmy like it was on a paint mixer. Glasses in the kitchen rattled, 
statuettes that my mum collected fell to the hardwood floor and shattered. The terror grew to a knot in my gut, and I tasted stomach acid in the back of my throat. As the trailer quivered, so did I, my face turning cold and pasty in my snotty hands. Andy kept screaming as the thing, God, whatever it was, as the thing outside kept tapping and crying out in his voice. Mommy, please, I'm so scared. May, I swear to God, if you don't let me in, I'm going to kill you, Andy, and Jack, and then burn this whole fucking place down. The voice in the door demanded. Jack, Jack, please get mom. Andy's voice cried, muffled, through the window. Please, Jack, tell her I'm sorry for breaking the window earlier. Tell her I'm sorry I tried to get you trampled by that bull. Tell her I'm sorry I tried to kill you when you were born. Please, please apologize to her for me, Jack. I'm so cold. I'm so scared. The real Andy had stopped screaming and was rocking next to me, sniffling as much as I was. I dared to peek through my soaked fingers at him and saw that his gaze was still stuck on the window. The candle had been snuffed out, but a hellish red glow emanated from the window. I didn't dare look. Did you try to... Did you try to kill me, Andy? He started sobbing, wailing. I had my answer. Tears returned to my eyes, but now, for a different reason. My mother was in a screaming fit at the thing at the front door, her voice hoarse and hellish as it erupted from the moor of the dark hallway. May, please let me in, please. I'm sorry, God, I'm so sorry. I know I just scared you, but... The thing spoke in a single run with no punctuation. It too began wailing, crying. My father is an extraordinary man, a man I look up to even to this day, and is one of the strongest people I have ever met, even back then, before I knew him as well as I do now. His crying unnerved me. To hear a man of such power and strength cry, it's not natural. The moans and utterances sent shivers down my spine. The trailer had stopped quivering like an animal in its death throes. Please, please just go the fuck away. My mum pleaded to the thing behind the door. And, just like that, it stopped. The storm resumed its tantrum for the rest of the night. And for the rest of the night, we sat huddled in the middle of the den, shivering as the wind moaned and screamed around the trailer, rocking it. The odor of death lingered for a little while longer, even after the lights came back on. My brother and I watched Star Wars on VHS, as the TV service was lacking due to the storm. Neither of us brought up what the thing outside the window had said, but we didn't talk for about a month afterward. We were still inseparable up to our teen years, but this was just a rough spot. Dad came home around six the next morning, unlocking the back door with his keys and wearily stomping in. He saw us in a pile, sleeping like the dead. May? Boys? He woke us up in a strong yet gentle tone. With him had come a clear blue sky, void of any remnants of the storm before. Or perhaps his presence had made the storm go away. <laughs> I like to think that it was the latter. I have something to show you, Jack. You can come in if you want, but it's kind of scary. Of course I went. I couldn't look scared in front of my dad. Even back then I had my pride. We followed our tired dad down the hall with mum in tow, groggily stumbling over pictures and ornaments that had fallen in the shaking. We all exited out the back door, where the horror had begun. On the wet wooden porch, 
which was admittedly in the state of disrepair, laid a rotting carcass of a buck. His antlers were strewn with ribbons of crimson flesh and stained with blood. Later in life I read about antler molting and how bloody it could be, but this definitely was not that. The corpse looked to be at least a week old, as the abdomen had collapsed and maggots were nestled in the eye sockets. The tongue of the deer hung out almost comically. I grabbed hold of my mum's hand and squeezed. The scariest thing about it, however, was that the deer had human teeth. The face had been eaten away by scavengers, and beneath the tatters of flesh that remained, perfectly white teeth grew from the skull. There's more, Dad said softly, looking concerned at my mom. This, this, I have never told anyone this next part. There was a reason I wanted to remain anonymous and have names change and everything. It's not exactly legal. We followed my dad off the porch and around the side of the trailer, where the bay window looked into the den. Laying there was the corpse of a small child, about the same age as Andy. My young mind couldn't comprehend what I was looking at, so I just stared absorbing the details. The stench was like old meat that had been sitting in water too long. Like if you leave your dishes in a sink of water for a month. Hey, don't judge me, I live alone. The skin of the boy was as grey as the thunderclouds before the storm. Cracks and splits riddled the surface, and from it oozed a tan substance that appeared to have the consistency of apple sauce. The child's stomach was bloated, his eyes half eaten by the fauna. His black hair was sparse as if someone, or something, had ripped it out. A look of placated acceptance sat upon the boy's face, as if he was okay with death as he was passing from this world. His chest, God, his chest was split open his ribs gaping and tearing through the decaying flesh like shark teeth. Between his lungs, where his heart should have been, lay a dead, coiled snake. It too had been partially feasted upon, and it seemed to have bored holes through the child's body before its eventual death, as gaping wounds could be seen throughout the child's torso. My mum stifled a cry, and my dad stared on blankly. We have to bury him, my dad finally said in a stone-cold tone. We can drag the deer to the woods, but we have to bury this child. None of us argued. None of us questioned why we shouldn't call the police. As my mum and brother dragged the deer to the woods, my father and I started digging. He used a large shovel, and I used a trench tool as it fit my size. The earth was riddled with rocks and roots, so digging the five-foot hole took about as many hours. After three feet in, my dad wouldn't let me dig anymore, instead having me take all the removed dirt and put it in a nice pile. Once that was done, and the sun had reached midday, we moved the boy. The air was hot and muggy after the storm, so the smell of decay was even more prominent. My dad stopped himself from throwing up twice as he rolled the body onto a blue utility tarp, but I wasn't so lucky. I puked, then dry heaved for at least ten minutes. The body landed at the bottom of the grave with a very dull thud, and we began to cover it back up. We washed up and went to a friend's house for the rest of the week. We told them we had a mild leak from the storm that was patched now, but we had to let the house air out. They saw us as good folk, so they didn't question us, though surely they noticed the air of despair and surrender surrounding us. The screams in the night from my brother and mum, the blank coldness of my father, 
and my staring into nothingness. We had marked the grave with a cross made of tree branches and vine. The funny part about all of this is that years later, we placed a raised garden over the grave, and the flowers grew so beautifully. The fruits and vegetables grew to large sizes without fertilizers or treatment, and, after getting past the stigma of the plot, tasted delicious. None of us ever talked about that night after my mum divulged to my father what had happened. We all knew it had happened, but we decided to treat it like a bad dream. I remember that for the remainder of my time at that trailer, as I would wait for the school bus at the bottom of the hill in the early mornings. I would hear Andy humming. He was humming from beneath a cedar tree. Sometimes he would try to get me to come over. Sometimes he would cry. But usually he just hummed a merry tune, a happy melody. It was unsettling because until he moved out, my brother always stood right next to me as we both waited for the bus, not beneath the large cedar tree. Quite a story that one, wasn't it? Have you ever had anything like that happen to you in a storm? Or just any kind of strange occurrence at all? If so, please be sure to leave a comment down below under the video. You know how much I love reading them and responding. <laughs> so make sure you take the time to write to me, okay? Well, I'll be back again on Friday. But for now, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.